everyone, Dave here with you again to talk to you more about stereo photography in this camera, the Stereo Realist. In my first video, I went over exactly how to load film into your Stereo Realist, and so now that you have film in your camera, it's time to get out there and start creating some 3D images. The Stereo Realist is a fully mechanical camera that uses 35mm film, um, so it's not quite as simple to use as a cell phone or a point-and-shoot camera. There are a certain number of steps that you need to take in order to get the camera to function properly so that you can get great results. So in this video, I'm going to go over exactly how to use this camera and how the camera works so you can start capturing your favorite scenes in amazing 3D. Stereo photography really is a lot of fun, so let's get into it. The Stereo Realist is a classic film camera that was specifically designed for stereo photography. And even though these cameras are 60 to 70 years old today, they still produce images that are more realistic and true to life, in my opinion, than any traditional cameras out there. And that's including today's modern digital cameras. And that's because this camera allows you to produce images in 3D. If you've been around for a while like me, you're used to using film and film cameras. But if you're from the younger generation, like my two sons who are in their early 20s and have grown up only in the digital age, you may have never used film or film cameras before. So if you're a newcomer to film, there are a couple things you need to know about film as opposed to using a modern digital camera. With digital images, you have the luxury of going back after the fact into something like Photoshop or Lightroom to make adjustments or corrections if your exposure wasn't correct or if you didn't have the exposure settings right when you first took the shot. Um, with film, it's a little bit different, especially with slide film. With slide film, um, you have no way of making adjustments after the fact. So when you take your shot, you really need to make sure those exposure settings are correct because when you send your film out to be developed and you get it back, um, you simply get the results you get. There's no way to make any adjustments afterwards. So it's very critical to get those exposure settings correct when you're taking the shot. Another thing to be conscious of when shooting with film is you only have a limited number of shots on each roll. So it's not like shooting with digital where you can just blast away endlessly until you fill up your memory card. Um, so therefore you just want to take your time, be deliberate with what you're doing so that you make each shot count. Um, also when you're shooting with digital you can kind of select uh, which shots you might want to print or enlarge, whereas with film you have to develop the entire roll of film in order to see any of your results. So again, just be conscious of that, um, take your time so you can make the most out of each roll that you shoot. The Stereo Realist is a film camera that uses 35mm film, but you want to make sure you're using slide film in the camera and not print film. The camera was intended to be used with slide film, so that way you could view your images in a stereo viewer once you get your images back and uh, mounted in a stereo slide. So if you use print film, the camera will record images on print film, but you won't be able to view those images in a stereo viewer. And so you want to make sure you're using the camera the way it was intended to be used so you, that you can see your images in the most eye-popping way, which is through a stereo viewer. So again, make sure you're using slide film in the camera and not print film. Because a stereo realist is a fully manual camera, it doesn't have any automatic modes like a modern digital camera or a cell phone. So therefore, we physically have to set the exposure settings on the camera itself. In photography, there are three settings that determine the exposure of your photo. The ISO, the aperture, and the shutter speed. The ISO is the sensitivity to light of your digital sensor or the film that you're using in your film camera. Um, in a film camera, the ISO is determined by the speed of the film that you're using. So in this case, we're using ISO 100 speed film. So our ISO is set at 100 and there's no actual adjustment that needs to be made on the camera itself. The aperture is the size of the opening that allows light to pass through the lens to hit the film, and the shutter speed dictates the duration of time that the film is allowed to be exposed to light. So these are the two settings that we need to make on our Stereo Realist. When shooting with slide film, you really need to make sure your exposure settings are correct. 
if you allow too much light into the scene for the conditions you're shooting in, your shot is going to be overexposed or blown out and look way too bright. If you don't allow enough light into the scene for the conditions you're shooting in, your shot is going to be underexposed and look way too dark. We're trying to make sure we get the correct exposure so we get a very lifelike, natural scene with great color saturation. The Stereo Realist is a vintage camera from the 1950s and 60s time frame. And like many cameras from that era, um, it also does not have a built-in light meter like today's modern digital cameras. So then you might say, well, then how do I know how to set the exposure settings? Well, you have a couple of different options to do that. Before we get into the correct way to determine the exposure settings or to meter the scene, there's one mistake that I don't want you to make. Many stereo realists have this table of recommended exposure settings on the underside of the camera's lens cover. So you might look at this and say, well, why can't I just use these exposure settings? It's telling me right here what I should be using based on the lighting conditions that I'm shooting in. Well, the reason you can't use these settings is because these were set up for a film that was much slower than the modern film that we're using today. In the 1950s, they were using a film with a film speed of ISO 10, which required much more light to properly expose the photo for the given lighting conditions you were shooting in. So if you were to use these exposure settings with today's modern ISO 100 speed film, your photos would come out very much overexposed or blown out, and you really wouldn't be very happy with the results. So you need to be conscious not to use these exposure settings and to use exposure settings that are appropriate for today's modern ISO 100 speed film when you're setting up to take your shot. Using your modern digital camera, if you have one, is really the best option to use to meter your scene when shooting with your stereo realist. The reason for that is because you can set your exposure settings, take a test shot, and get instant results right in front of you so you can tell whether or not you like the exposure settings or whether you need to make adjustments. Once you get the exposure settings correct, simply transfer those onto your Stereo Realist and you know your exposure is going to be correct when you take your shot with your Stereo Realist. You could also use any film camera with a light meter in it or a handheld meter to meter the scene in the same way. The only difference is, is that you won't be able to take a test shot and get instant results right in front of you like you can do with a digital camera. Back in the days before digital, this is what I used to use to meter the scene when I was shooting with my Stereo Realist and I generally got good results with it. So what if you don't have a digital camera or any other camera with a light meter in it or a handheld light meter to help determine what your exposure settings should be? Well, you still have one more option left, and that is to use the Sunny 16 rule. So what is the Sunny 16 rule? The Sunny 16 rule is a rule photographers have been using for decades to tell them what the correct exposure settings should be on a bright sunny day like we have today. And basically what the rule says is that if you're shooting at f16 in terms of, of your aperture, then your correct shutter speed on a bright sunny day like today would be one over the film speed that you're using in terms of your um, shutter speed in a fraction of a second. So for example, if you were using 100 speed film, your shutter speed should be one one hundredth of a second, shooting at f16. And that would give you your correct exposure on a bright sunny day like we have today. The only problem with this is that it's not quite accurate if you're not shooting in the proper conditions, meaning if you're shooting on a sunny day but you go into a shaded area, then that exposure setting isn't going to be correct. Or if you have overcast conditions, then that exposure setting might be off as well. So it's not the best way to go in the world in terms of selecting your exposure settings, but it's something you can use if you don't have the other options available to you. If you're going to be using the Sunny 16 rule for your exposure settings, you need to know that it's only going to work well if the sun is shining down on your subject with the sun at your back or roughly at 45 degree angles to your back or so. If you're shooting into the sun, then those exposure settings are not going to be correct. Also, you would need to be shooting during the sunny parts of the day, meaning not at dusk or dawn, even though it's going to be a sunny day. You need to be shooting during those hours, for example, that you might be out to get a suntan. Um, so those are the times that the Sunny 16 rule would work. If you're shooting at dusk or dawn, again, those exposure settings are not going to be accurate. So let's test out the Sunny 16 rule. I've got the meter on my digital camera set to ISO 100 since I'm using ISO 100 speed film in my Stereo Realist. And I've got the aperture set at F16 and the shutter speed set to 1 one hundredth of a second. Again, since that's what I'm supposed to use, as the rule says, 1 over the film speed that I'm using, which is in this case ISO 100. So my shutter speed is one one hundredth of a second. I've got the sun at my back shining down on my subject. So let's take a test shot and see how it looks.
As you can see, the exposure is pretty accurate. So let's go over how to adjust the aperture and the shutter speed. To set the aperture for the camera, there's a white mark on the top of the lens that has the aperture settings around it. And as you can also see, there's a mark for each potential aperture that you could select. And so what you do is you simply rotate the lens barrel so that you match up the mark for the desired aperture that you're looking for with the mark on the top of the lens. The aperture range for the camera is f3.5 with the lenses wide open, going down to f22, which is the smallest aperture setting for the camera or a range of f2.8 to f22 if you have the 2.8 version of the camera, which is the more rare version of the camera with the higher quality lenses. So as I rotate the lens from f3.5, which is wide open, you can see the lens apertures close down as I move the f-stop down to f22, which is the smallest aperture for the camera. As you notice, if I turn the one lens barrel, that both lens barrels move together, and that's true if I rotate the other lens. Um, again, both lenses will adjust the aperture simultaneously. And that's how you adjust your apertures on the camera. On this camera, with the lens cover removed, you can see there's a metal band that goes around both lens barrels of the camera. And this is what causes both lens barrels to move together as I adjust the aperture. You may have also noticed on this table of recommended exposure settings that there are certain aperture settings such as f6.3 and f9 that are not actually found on the lens barrel of the camera where the aperture settings are, are shown. Um, so in order to achieve these particular f-stop settings, you would have had to have set the um, lens barrel to a point in between some of these existing marks on the lens barrel. So to achieve an aperture of f6.3, you could set the aperture mark in between the aperture setting of 5.6 and f8 to achieve f6.3. And so in terms of setting your aperture, you can set the aperture mark in between the marks for the particular settings that are shown on the lens barrel if you're looking to achieve an aperture that's not represented on the lens barrel, such as f6.3 or f9. To set the shutter speed on the camera, there's a ring around the viewfinder lens which has your available shutter speed settings. The shutter speed range goes from 1 1 of a second, which is the fastest shutter speed available, all the way down to 1 full second. If you have the 2.8 version of the camera, your shutter speeds go from 1 200th of a second down to 1 full second. So you have a slightly faster shutter speed availability on the 2.8 version. Each one of these shutter speed settings has its own mark, which you would match up to this arrow to set the shutter speed to what you want. In this case, I have this set to 1 1 of a second, so when I cock the shutter and fire the camera, you can see that it's a fast exposure. If I want to readjust that, I simply rotate this ring to the de desired shutter speed that I want, which is in this case going to be 1 full second. So when I cock the shutter and fire the camera, I get my 1 full second exposure. You want to make sure that the arrow is set to the specific mark for the shutter speed and that it's not somewhere in between. That way you'll make sure your shutter speeds are going to be accurate to what you want to set them at. Um, also, you want to make sure that you set the shutter speed first and then cock the shutter for the camera. Um, this camera has mechanical timing mechanisms inside of it and so if you set this to a certain shutter speed and then you cock the shutter and then you go try to readjust this to another shutter speed, it could throw off or damage the timing mechanisms inside the camera. So again, select the shutter speed that you want, then cock the shutter, and then take your exposure. And that's how you set your shutter speeds on the Stereo Realist. The B for bulb and T for timer settings on the shutter speed ring are used when you're trying to do exposures longer than one second. And this, this is typically done when you have the camera on a tripod and you're using a cable release to trip the shutter. So with the, with the ring set to B for bulb and you cock the shutter, when you trip your cable release and hold it down, the shutters will remain open until you take your finger off the cable release and then the shutters will close back down. Um, with the ring set to T for timer, when you cock the shutter, 
and you trip your cable release button, you can leave that open without holding your finger down on that button and the shutters will remain open until such time that you trip the shutter release button one more time and that will close the shutters back down. And again, this is when you're trying to use very long exposures for certain desired effects or depending on the lighting conditions that you're shooting in where you just need very long exposures to get the proper exposure for what you're trying to shoot. On this camera with the lens board removed, you can see the mechanisms behind the scenes that operate the shutters. Now let's take a look at these in action. With the camera set for a one second exposure, let's take a look at how the mechanisms work to fire both shutters at the same time. And there you go. The next thing that you want to do is to set your focus point. To set the focus point on the Stereo Realist, there's a wheel on the side of the camera that you use to set your focus point. So for example, if I want to use 10 feet away from the camera as my focus point, I simply rotate this wheel until 10 is lined up with the mark, as shown here. And that's how you set your focus point on the Stereo Realist. In this step of the field chart that was included in the instruction manual for the Stereo Realist when the camera was sold, you can see all the different depth of field ranges you would get based on the aperture that you select and the focus point that you choose. And this is great to have so that you can know what the depth of field is going to be for the shot that you're taking so that you have it as a reference when you're out shooting with your Stereo Realist. On the newer versions of the Stereo Realist, there's a depth of field scale set up around the focus mark on the outside edge of the focus wheel. And this is set up to let you know what the depth of field range is going to be for the given aperture that you select and the focus point that you choose for your shot. And the way that this is set up is there's a mark on each side of the scale showing you what the near range and the far range of your depth of field is going to be. And so anything on the inside of the set of marks is going to be in focus. So for example, if I'm using F16 and my focus point is set at 10 feet from the camera, this is letting me know that anything just about five feet or so all the way to infinity is going to be in focus uh, in terms of my depth of field for that shot. If I then shift the focus point from 10 feet to five feet from the camera, you can see that my depth of field range changes if I'm using F16 from just over three feet now to just about 12 feet or so. So just by shifting the focus point on the focus wheel is going to change the depth of field in the shot that I'm taking. And this matches up pretty well with the depth of field range table that we looked at earlier in the video. On older versions of the camera like this one, you'll notice there is no depth of field scale on the side of the camera. There's simply the mark to set the focus point. So again, if I want to set the focus point to 10 feet away from the camera, I simply rotate the wheel and set 10 feet at that mark. But since you don't have the depth of field scale here, if you want to know what the depth of field for your shot is going to be based on the aperture that you're using, then you would have to refer to the depth of field table that we looked at earlier. In this first photo, you can see an example of a shot that has a very shallow depth of field where only the foreground is in focus versus the second photo, which has a very deep depth of field where everything within the frame is in focus. I tend to prefer shooting with a very deep depth of field, so that way when I go to view the photo, I can see all the different layers in the frame as I peer into the 3D image. In terms of depth of field, there really is no right or wrong. It's just a matter of personal preference that you as a photographer wish to use to capture the scene that you're shooting. In terms of being able to focus on a subject that's close to the camera or that's further away from the camera, the camera has to be able to change the distance between the lens and the film plane in order to adjust the focus. In most traditional cameras, that's done by the lens moving further or closer to the film plane, which is fixed in place. On the Stereo Realist, it's just the opposite. The lenses are fixed in place and it's the film plane that moves back and forth when you adjust the focus. As you can see here, as I adjust to turn the focus wheel, you can see the whole film plane in the back that moves forward or backwards depending on how I focus the camera. And that's how the focus is done on the Stereo Realist. The lenses are fixed in place, 
and they were set in place when the camera was made uh, back at the factory. So as I adjust the lens barrel to adjust the different aperture for the camera, you can see that the lenses stay fixed in place and don't move at all. Once you've decided on the shutter speed that you're going to use and you're ready to take your shot, the last thing you're going to do is cock the shutter on the camera. Um, to cock the shutter, you simply take this lever that's at the bottom of the camera's front and push it all the way over until it clicks and then let it go. And now you've got the shutter cocked on the camera and you're ready to take your shot. When you go to cock the shutter on the camera, you will notice there is some resistance when you're pushing that cocking lever over, and that's normal. Um, once you've already cocked the shutter, if you try to push that lever over again, you'll feel there's no resistance there anymore, and that's letting you know that the, sh the shutter's already been cocked and you're ready to take your shot. When you're going to take your shot, you do have to physically depress the shutter release button in order to get the camera to fire. But when you're doing that, you want to make sure you're just depressing the shutter release button and not dropping the whole camera when you're taking your shot. So if you're going to take your shot and you press the shutter release button and you press the whole camera down at the same time, you're going to cause camera shake and that's going to result in blurry photos. So remember, when you're taking your shot, depress the shutter release button only, but hold the camera steady so that way you won't have that issue. So if you just hold the camera up, to depress the shutter release button by itself, you'll have no issues. If you're going to be using a shutter speed of 1 50th of a second or faster, you won't have any problems with camera shake when hand holding the camera when you're taking your shot. If you're going to use a shutter speed of 1 25th of a second or slower, you really want to put the camera on a tripod because it's going to be very difficult for someone, even if they have a very steady hand, to hold the camera steady for a shutter speed of 1 25th of a second or slower. So you want to take your camera, mount it on a tripod, and use a cable release to trip the shutter. On the bottom of the camera there's a tripod socket mount which takes the standard quarter 20 screw which um, fortunately has pretty much been the standard since the 1950s so this camera will mount to the vast majority of tripods that exist out there today. So the cable release simply screws into the port on the top of the camera for the cable release. That way when you go to do your long exposure you don't have to press the shutter release button on the top of the camera and possibly shake the camera. So instead, you just press the button on your cable release and that'll trip the shutter for you. So when you go to take your shot, you get your long exposure and the camera stays nice and steady. The port for the cable release is right here, just in front of the shutter release button or the fire button on the camera. And it is a threaded port. So you basically just take your cable release and screw it into that port, being careful not to cross thread it so that you don't damage the threads on either your cable release or on the camera itself. On the top of the camera, there's this exposed film indicator mark right here, which before you've taken your exposure on the frame that you're on, will be silver co colored like this. When you fire the shutter, that instantly turns red, letting you know that the frame you just shot has now been exposed and telling you that you need to advance the film before you try to take another shot. To advance the film, you have to press in this film advance release button so you can get the film advance knob to move again. And when you do that, when you advance to the next frame, the exposed film indicator will reset itself from red back to silver. So press this button in just long enough to get the advance knob to start turning and then take your finger off that button and advance the knob until it stops. And as you can see, the um, exposed film indicator has reset itself back to silver. If you have a version of the camera like this one, which has the double exposure prevention button on it, then this will prevent you from accidentally double exposing your film if you cock the shutter again and try to take a shot without advancing the film. So what happens is the camera does allow you to recock the shutter but because of this double exposure prevention button, if you go to press the shutter release button again to fire another shot, it won't let you depress the shutter release button to double expose the film accidentally. Um, so if you, if you don't have a version of that with the double exposure prevention button like this, like this older version, um, then you definitely can 
cock the shutter again and accidentally double expose the film if you're not paying attention to that indicator. And um, trust me, I know because I've done it before and it's uh, <laughs> not too much fun when you get your pictures back thinking you're going to look at some cool shots and you see that they're double exposed. So um, this camera right here is the first stereo realist that I had ever gotten and it doesn't have the double exposure prevention button and um, at some points in time I definitely have accidentally overexposed shots. If your camera does have the double exposure prevention button and you do want to intentionally double expose the film for certain artistic reasons or to create certain effects then you can do that. You simply have to pull this button out and that will reset and allow you to double expose the film. Once you're done doing your intentional double exposure, then you need to reset this pin in place by pulling it out slightly and letting it drop back into place. And so then it will do its job in terms of um, preventing you from accidentally double exposing frames as you move forward through the roll. Um, so again, if this pin is pulled out, you can keep cocking the shutter and keep firing on the same frame. And so if you're not looking to do, intentionally do that, then you really need to make sure this pin is set back in place um, so it can do its job to prevent uh, accidental double exposure on these frames. Now that we know how the camera works, it's time to put all these steps into practice and get out to the fun part, which is using this camera to create 3D images. Well, we made it out to a site to start shooting with our stereo realist, and before I take some shots, I'm going to meter the scene I want to shoot with my digital camera. Um, so I've got the camera's meter set to ISO 100, since we're using ISO 100 speed film in our stereo realist. So let me take a meter reading with this camera and see what I get. Um, I've got this set to aperture priority mode, which means I'm picking the aperture and the camera will tell me which shutter speed I should use. So in this case, I've set this to um, f11 because I want to see what shutter speed I should be using if I'm using an aperture of f11. So when I meter the scene, the camera is telling me that I should be using a shutter speed of 1 250th of a second. Well, on the Stereo Realist, the fastest shutter speed I have available is only 1 150th of a second. So therefore, f11 is letting too much light into the camera so I need to close down the aperture to get to a shutter speed that I can use on my stereo realist. So I'm gonna drop the aperture down to f16 and see what I get for a meter reading. Back. Okay now it's telling me I should use 1 1 25th of a second and on the stereo realist, I can use 1 100th of a second or 1 1 50th of a second. Um, so in this instance, I'm going to go with 1 100th of a second and shoot that and see what I get from my exposure. And that exposure looks pretty good, so I'm going to dial those settings into my stereo realist and start taking some stereo images. So now that I have my exposure settings figured out, I'm going to dial those into my stereo realist. I'm going to set my aperture to f16 and I'm going to set my shutter speed to 1 100th of a second and now my exposure settings are set. The next thing I need to do is adjust my focus point. In this case I'm going to set my focus point to 10 feet away from the camera. That way anything from 5 feet away from me in the frame all the way out to infinity will be in focus. When I'm setting my focus point on the camera, you'll notice that I'm not using the split level range finder to determine where I'm going to set my focus point. I'm simply using the distances shown on the side of the focus wheel instead of using the split level range finder to set my focus point. Um, that's because the split level range finder sometimes may not be accurate because because of the age of the camera, it might be out of alignment. So you really want to just go with these uh, distances shown on the side of the focus wheel in terms of how to set your focus point. So now I've got my exposure setting set. I've adjusted my focus. The last thing I need to do is cock the shutter before I take my shot. So I flip the lever over on the bottom here to cock the shutter. Shutter's all cocked and ready to shoot. And now it's just up to me to frame the shot and take my stereo in. And there you go. Once I've taken my shot, you can notice that the um, film exposed 
the exposed film indicator has turned to red, letting me know that I've exposed that frame. And so therefore, um, in order to take another shot, I need to advance the film. So I press my film advance release button, turn the advance knob until it clicks. And now I'm all set and ready to go to take my next exposure. When you're shooting with your stereo realist, you want to make sure you hold the camera in such a way that you keep both of your hands outside of the view of the lenses. Um, the last thing you want to have happen is get your film back after you've gotten it developed and find out that one of your frames from one of your image pairs has your finger halfway through the frame. So remember, hold your hands so that they're on the outside of the camera. That way your hands will stay outside of the view of either one of the lenses. So there you go. You now know all the steps you need to know in order to get out there and shoot with your stereo realist. So let's go over those steps again real quick. First, meter the scene that you want to shoot to determine your exposure settings. Second, set your exposure settings on your stereo realist by setting the aperture and the shutter speed. Third, set the focus point on the camera. And last, cock the shutter so that you're ready to shoot. The last thing to do is compose your image and take your shot. So now that you got that all figured out, the only thing that's left is the creativity part. That's all up to you. So that's it. You should be all set now to get out there and start having some fun shooting with your stereo realist and creating some 3D images. Thanks so much for watching. Hopefully you found the information in this video helpful to help you out with your stereo realist shooting experience. Um, if you have any questions or comments about this video or my first one, please send them along. And hopefully you can also hit that subscribe button and the like button as well to stay tuned for future video content I have coming your way. And I'd also be interested in hearing any thoughts, experiences, information you have about your stereo realist as well. So maybe email those along to me. I'd love to hear from you. So uh, until the next video, have fun, get out there, and enjoy the experience of shooting in stereo.